thinking about your capabilities first allows you to measure the distance to best practices. Today, we're introducing a capability-based framework in eight dimensions total, focusing your planning on the capabilities where you still have easy wins. Hi, this is Carsten from Hacking Matters, where each week we look at the best practices in cybersecurity. This week, we answer the overarching question, what does good look like in cyber? How do we measure ourselves? How do we compare ourselves to others? The standard way of conceptualizing security is the NIST framework, which splits the pie into five pieces. Identify, prevent, detect, respond, and recover. Five complementary areas, and between them, you do anything from identifying risk and stopping them before they even become reality, to having gotten hacked and doing something about it, and anything in between. In our earlier videos, we streamlined this further into three, prevent, detect, recover. Whichever one of these approaches you use, they are outcome, goal-based. You set a goal and you retroactively argue which of your capabilities are there to meet these goals. Now today, we want to switch gears and look at it from a different perspective. What capabilities allow you to reach those goals? Because just by setting there's a goal doesn't really help you reach it unless you also have a tool set, another way of thinking about it, that gives rise to capabilities that ultimately meet those goals. Today we're introducing a capability-based framework in eight capability dimensions total, split between four organizational and four technical controls. We'll go through each of them in sequence and look at some examples that would be considered future-ready in each of those dimensions. Important to note that you don't need all of these capabilities at the same maturity all at the same time. We'll see examples where if one particular area is very strong, some others have some more leeway of being behind best practice. And especially in innovation-focused environments, you need that flexibility sometimes. You can't achieve everything all at once. So here are the eight capabilities between organizational and technology capabilities. And going through them top to bottom, the first capability is your governance is streamlined. That is, people know who's responsible for what when it comes to security. Without that responsibility, everything later on becomes more difficult. Different people might work on the same topic, but more importantly, some topics might be believed to be in somebody else's responsibility and ultimately nobody feels responsible. So you start with your governance as the foundation to make sure everything else can be worked on. Second, your technical architecture needs to be formalized, at least to some extent. That is, you need guidance as to what technology components we use at our organization and you need guidance how to keep those relatively secure. For example, your guidance could be Every system we're building, we need two of, so that if one fails over or is taken down for patching cycle, the other one can take over. It makes a lot of other decisions later, like patching cycles, a lot easier. Another architecture suggestion could be everything needs to be backupped in a certain way so that if we lose a system, we can easily recover it. A third example, network segregation, make sure that your most critical data is never directly connected to the internet, but always goes through some security controls. So these are guidelines that are formalized before the technology is actually being created. And similar to the governance we talked about earlier, it's a foundational element that makes everything that comes later a little bit easier. So now we know who's responsible for security, and they have defined certain guidelines for everyone else to follow on the technology level. The same is needed on a people level. So the third area is your users are aware of the responsibility when it comes to information security. They feel accountable for their actions and they know how to, for instance, avoid becoming the victim of social engineering. Fourth, the final element on the organizational side, again, deals with people. In this case, more the management and the management needs to be crisis ready so that in the event that you do get hacked, the response can be swift and focused. This mostly involves preparing them through trainings. So once a year, do pretend that you do get hacked, get everyone into a room and say, you know, this is a simulated crisis. See how you would deal with that. 
making sure everyone makes the mistakes that are very natural and human, of blaming the hackers, blaming your people, giving up too soon, right? Make all of those mistakes in the protected environment of a crisis simulation so that if it really happens, you've already learned and are more mature in dealing with crisis. So those are the organizational capabilities, basically saying we know who's responsible, we have some guidelines for the rest of the company, our users are away and accountable, and our managers know how to handle a crisis should it ever arise. So we still need the technical areas though, because the systems we're now going to create that live in the architecture we defined earlier, they can be secure or insecure. And in four areas do we make a difference here. The first area is, of course, the systems themselves need to be hardened and then regularly patched and once in a while brought up to the latest hardening standard. This is a standard process for most organizations. There's almost always exceptions to this, either because of lack of visibility, that's bad, or because you actively accepted risk. We talked about risk acceptances in another video. So it's okay if you don't get this 100% right, but it is important to have this baseline standard of hardening and patching to be able to defend your system so that vulnerabilities are the exception and not the norm. The next capability then on our list deals with finding those vulnerabilities. As we established elsewhere, vulnerability management is not actually managing the vulnerabilities directly, but managing those other processes like patching, hardening, identity management, network segregation, and a few others, and finding areas where those processes don't perform and where you find issues. For instance, if your programmers follow certain guidelines, in theory, they shouldn't have any bugs. But in practice, of course, every pen test says otherwise. So running regular pen tests, running regular scans, including information from, for instance, threat intelligence or bug bounties, and condensing all of those into saying, this is where we need to do better. So to maintain a good hacking resilience level. That's the area of vulnerability management. The seventh capability then comes back to the humans, specifically the highly privileged uh, humans whose access is hacking gold. If you can pop a cloud admin or an Active Directory domain admin, you have basically won. So those specific identity needs to be double and triple secured. And often that's done through privileged identity management systems. So more factor authentication, more monitoring on them, more segregation so that this access can only happen through specific management VLANs, for instance. Very important capability in slowing down hacking journeys. Finally, the eighth capability, system monitoring. Between everything we, we listed so far, there shouldn't be any hacking, right? You have good governance and architecture. Everyone is crisis aware and has good access management. Your systems are patched hard and vulnerability management, and yet it will happen. None of these processes ever work 100%. So you need to be able to spot the hackers on your systems, on premise, in the cloud, anywhere in between, and be able to do something about it. Often this capability is outsourced since running 24-7 monitoring is a lot of work for one small company, but doing it for dozens or hundred companies, of course, is much less work on the margin. So these eight dimensions, imagine now you have some way of assessing yourself versus your peer group. Peers will be possibly better in some areas, not so good in other areas, and that's okay. Everyone takes their battles individually and differently. For instance, if you're not so great at patching, hardening, and vulnerability management, as an example, you need to be extra good at security monitoring, at crisis response, and maybe at backups. So different capabilities can be complements for one another. What is still true, though, is typically the area in which you are least good is the one where you can make the easiest gains to catch up with your peer group and then possibly even exceed their average level. And so having a peer group comparison is important to give you the next actionable items. Let's now go through these eight dimensions once again and just sharing a few ideas as to what good really looks like in those areas. Now that's not prescriptive. There's multiple ways of being good in these areas, but I'll just give you some ideas for inspiration so that if you were just starting in an area or you're unsure what to do next as a bit of a guiding North Star 
to take you in the right direction. In our first area, governance. Your North Star could be that you agreed organization-wide on a risk appetite and people speak in terms of risk appetites and risk acceptances so that it's never unclear whether we as an organization want to take a certain risk, that all of those definitions have been preempted. Hence, you can really focus on areas where everyone agrees certain risks shouldn't be taken and do something about it. Do you have that kind of a risk dialogue already? If not, that's probably an easy win because it doesn't require any big technical rollouts. It doesn't require any big changes. It really is much more psychology than anything else. Getting people to think in terms of risk and thinking in terms of risk, not necessarily as a bad thing, but as an ingredient that becomes lethal if you take too much of it. On architecture, your guiding North Star is to specify a few technologies that are security critical so that people don't have to keep reinventing the wheel. One clearly is identification and access. Make sure everyone uses a central identity. Second is, of course, around network segregation, what we traditionally think in terms of architecture, what is allowed to be exposed publicly, and what needs to be shielded by additional security controls, perhaps behind a DMZ. A third area is backup strategy, much more important after a decade of, of ransomware, of course, but has always been part of security architecture. And there's other areas. But if you pick just door three and you have clear guidelines to your organizations, you're already doing better than average. Third, user awareness. Your North Star here should be people being aware of how hackers are trying to get them. Social engineering is never going to go away, but really experiencing it regularly, having war stories shared, having colleagues talk about how they got hacked, perhaps by your own security team, really immunizes your organization from the real threat. Crisis readiness, we already mentioned it. Yearly crisis simulations at the very least. Get everyone into a room and make them make all of their beginner mistakes in handling crises so that if within that year a real crisis happens, they're already prepared and not making those mistakes again. Turning to the technical controls, patching and hardening. Most people, of course, wish everything to be patched and hardened all the time. That's not possible. But on hardening, have golden images so that servers are at least born in a hardened state and then maybe update those golden images and those hardening standards once a year. On patching, of course, everything around Windows, Patch Tuesday. Do your patches that day or the next day. On Linux and middleware components, a little bit more complicated. Most organizations are fine doing quarterly patches, while at the same time, of course, shielding the most critical systems from the internet so you don't have an internet-exposed vulnerability hanging out for an entire quarter. Coming to vulnerability management, your best practice is to have a single pane of glass, have all of your different vulnerabilities from scanners, pandas, bug bounties, CICD, cloud dashboards, all aggregated into one place so you can clearly prioritize. Having the data is just a means. Doing something with the data in aggregate, that really is your goal here, your North Star. Seven, privileged access management. We already mentioned the, the North Star here. Keep your users as far away from your technology. And finally, system monitoring. Here, the North Star is relatively clear. Start by monitoring your endpoints through MDR, so basically an EDR plus a team to, to look over that, typically done by an outsourced vendor. And if you really want to go beyond or if you have some systems that are very hard to monitor with an EDR, like a factory, then add a CM on top, aggregate logs. But that really, for most, is outside the best practice area. Just do continuous monitoring with a good EDR, with a stable MDR team to look over your shoulder. So. These are your eight North Stars to guide you. And probably as you think through that list, you've already gotten an idea of where you're doing okay, where, where you're basically going in that direction, and where you're behind. And as per our earlier discussion, it's probably those areas where you're furthest behind, where it's easiest to make progress. So hopefully this helps in focusing your planning on the capabilities where you still have those easy wins. Circling back to the earlier comparison between goal-based 
standards like NIST and Gartner and capability-based frameworks like what we just discussed. These two, of course, map to one another. Here's an overview on how the eight dimensions we just talked about map into NIST. So you see that they kind of bunch up around protection. So NIST is still very important to make sure that the other areas also get a little bit of attention. But it is OK to spend, let's say, half of your effort in trying to prevent and only relatively less effort, for instance, in crisis response, because that happens so much less often. And being prepared is relatively easier. In summary, thinking about your capabilities first in, for instance, the eight dimensions allows you to measure the distance to best practices and define your next goals, goals, goals towards then later being able to explain, for instance, in the NIST framework, where you're putting your effort. The other way around, NIST does not help you set your next goals. It just helps you explain them once you reach them. In our work, we always start with, with those eight, eight dimensions. Now, your mileage might vary. You might want to break this separately. But as an important reminder, don't try to be perfect in all of these dimensions. Nobody is. Nobody ever will be. So pick your battles and focus on the areas where you think you can make the best progress next and reevaluate at least once per year. I hope this was helpful. If it was, let us know your feedback, your comments, please. Show us with a like and subscribe that you want to see more of this content. Until then, thank you and happy hacking.